All right, hi everyone, my name is Vanny and I'm doing an MA in Applied Linguistics in the Faculty of Arts and I'd like to share with you uh, my dissertation which as you can see is on Auckland metaphors. Now, as you might guess from my accent, I'm originally from the UK, but I've lived in New Zealand for the last seven years and I'll shortly be a citizen. So I consider Auckland my home, which explains the reason I'm interested in this topic. But why is this important for everybody? Well, some of you might be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, and you can see that housing is a basic need. And that's why I'm interested in this topic. But what about metaphors? Some of you guys might be familiar with metaphors from poetry and literature when you guys were at school, and that is very much where the linguistic research was held. That is until this book by uh, George Lakoff and Mark Johnson, which is very seminal in this field, called Metaphors We Live By. And the reason this book is important is because, um, whoa, sorry, <laughs> uh, they really showed that um, metaphors were in everyday language. And that really was a huge shift within the field. Now, I'll try to summarize their theory with this diagram. Um, they essentially believe that we actually conceive of the world in metaphors, and that's how we use language to express ourselves. So for example, we might believe that argument is war, and so we use language such as, he attacked everything I said. Now, these are examples of two key features within the theory, which is, they call them conceptual metaphor in terms of how we conceive things, and linguistic metaphor of how we express that it through language. So since this book came out, there's been a lot of research looking at the language that we use and working backwards to, feel, to figure out how we actually think. And that has been the way that research has generally been. But more recently, there's been a researcher called Lynn Cameron who argues that it could actually work the other way around. Perhaps the language that we use can actually shape the way that we think. So for example, if we use one set of metaphors, we might think in this way, and if we use another set of metaphors, it might lead us to think in another way. And that's something I'm inclined to agree with, and that's obviously what advertising and counsellors also hopefully believe as well. So that explains my uh, topic of Auckland housing and also metaphors. So my research question is, um, my research question is, what are the metaphors in Auckland housing, uh, as reported by the New Zealand Herald for 2015, which is historically the worst of housing affordability so far? So I had to look at every single day's papers of the um, New Zealand Herald. And so there are 365 copies to look through. And I'd like you to have a figure in your mind of a number of how many of those would have front page stories on housing. Um, so we'll come and see how close you are a bit later. So what did I do? Well, I did have to use this machine, which believe it or not, does exist right now in 2016 in Auckland City Library. Um, I did fortunately find a slightly newer version in the University Library, which made it a lot easier. So I essentially had to scan through the archives of 2015 to find um, articles. Now, um, as I said to you before, you need to have a number in your mind, I'll come to that shortly. But once I found the relevant articles, um, what I did was I did two forms of analysis. There was a manual part because metaphor at this stage is still has not been automated fully yet, but there is a second stage of using a computer program to enhance the reliability of my findings. So uh, let's see how close your number is. So I had 365 papers to look through and it was actually 83 articles that I found, which means once every four days. So it's a very salient topic. Um, and from these articles, I found 215 linguistic metaphors. And we'll do an example together so you see what I mean. So this is the first of three stages. So here's a, a front page. So have a quick look at that. And maybe you can see some words that kind of contrast with the basic um, or literal meaning of words. So these are the ones that I, I selected. And that was the first stage of what I had to do for every single article that I found. So the second stage is what we're about to do now which is um, just having a look at the, um, the uh, example that we found and then working backwards. So this would be the conceptual metaphor. AHM is Auckland housing market being a moving car, obviously connecting with brakes. And for predatory birds with, is with, to do with the word soaring. Now, although a lot of birds soar, actually a vast majority of them tend to be predatory birds such as eagles, etc. Now, that's the second stage, and as I did this, I began to find patterns of meaning that kind of kept reoccurring. So the third final stage is finding metaphor clusters. So, for example, car would go under um, the, the topic of vehicles, and uh, predatory birds would be under danger. So, 
by doing that, I actually found a total of 22 metaphor clusters, but three were highly salient because the top three accounted for 40% of all the data. And these are the top three, as uh, you've just seen. And these, num these numbers relate to the 215 um, articles. So that's the manual part of the analysis done. But what about the computer part? Well, that's using this program called W Matrix, which comes from Lancaster University in the UK. And the key point that this does is that it um, assigns a meaning category for each word. Um, so there are 21 categories. These are all of them. But we're going to look at this one in particular. And each of these have subdivisions. So for example, for government and the public domain, you'll see that G3 is warfare. So that's a tag that I can use to find all words connected with war. So you can see here that um, we've got G3 for warfare and all the others for heat and danger as well. So by doing this, I could then compare my manual results with what I found. So by doing that, I find something like this and I have a look and I can see that these are all the words connected with warfare. And then I have to click on the blue lines to find each individual um, hit list for each of them. So shortly, um, I'll do an example for um, hit because you can see you still have to read them manually. It's not been done um, automatically yet. So I still had to click through that for all of the categories that I found. Um, so by doing this, I, found I was able to compare my manual analysis with a corpus analysis. And what I found was that there was an increase of almost twice for war and heat, which means they're actually even more salient than I originally thought. Now, the reason danger goes down is to do the way that they categorize it. So I don't know why it's moving, sorry. Um, it's to do with, because uh, in danger, it was, for example, specific words like alarm and bomb and critical, whereas it doesn't consider words like predatory birds. So if I go back to my original uh, research question, I wanted to know about Auckland housing metaphors. Well, um, I can tell you that the three key salient metaphors are war, heat, and danger. And I would argue that this actually creates a metaphorical scenario because each of those interrelate with each other. And actually, you can say that Auckland housing market is war in general. Um, so what are the implications of this? So within my field, uh, a couple of things. First of all, no one's really done anything about housing and metaphors. So that's the first thing. The second thing is in terms of methodology, um, Everyone's either done manual only or corpus only. Uh, there's only been one study in 2007 where they actually did both of them. So that's something that I'm happy to have done. And uh, another thing, which I think for me is the most, personally the most important, is that um, it's to do with, if we talk back to looking at language, perhaps shaping the way that we think, then it's possible that if, you know, if we construe that the Auckland housing market as war, it could actually affect our very actions. So maybe you feel that you have to be a soldier in order to enter the war, and if you feel that you're not properly armoured, maybe you're not going to enter that war. So we need to know what all these metaphors are, because once you have that, you can then decide to accept it, question it, reject it, or resist it. But before you can do any of those actions, you have to know what they are. And that's very, very much where this research comes in as a very first step uh, to do with housing and metaphors. Um, and I am happy to answer any questions now. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> um, I was interested in the idea of the, the soaring metaphor being connected to predatory birds, and I'm wondering, um, does the metaphor have its power if people don't know that it's predatory birds at all? Because I didn't know that. So yep. what's the assumption there about how these things are yeah, it's a really good question. Um, and yeah, that's what's called conventional metaphor. In fact, we, we're so sort of used to it that we don't even think about it in a way. Like you're saying, like you didn't, you go, oh, yes, that's right, it's predatory birds. So there's, there's sort of two ways about it. First thing I need to say with this research is very much from a linguistic point of view, this is what we think. There's still the next step of research to talk about, are they perceived as such? And there's a, a lot of research that goes, depending on the metaphors, they might be perceived differently. Um, but essentially, the key focus within this research is that it's very subtle, these ways of of presenting language that we often don't necessarily think about it but and you have to remember you have to read the whole context of the article for it to really come across as that rather than just picking up that isolated isolated sentence thank you hi 
Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, you focus on all the metaphors which, uh, which have uh, uh, negative repercussions as well. No, and no, all of them. The, uh, if we think about the 9 11 post 9 11 scenario, we talk about war, war becomes connected with war and terror. And I think that in the present scenario, the present uh, war, we can't separate, we can't have the kind of meeting that we had before 9 11. So I was wondering, like, is it all the bad dreams that you have picked up? Uh, okay, interesting question. So first of all, I didn't cherry pick the metaphors. I looked at all the metaphors in all of the texts. So I didn't choose the ones that I wanted to find. So this is um, what I'm saying is that my findings relate to how it is being reported. So I, I'm only answering the question of what I saw in the article. So that's what I can say. So if you want to have a different story, then it requires someone else to write it. <laughs> okay. There was another question? No? The what? Sorry, the the, the, the text itself. Oh, okay. Yep. Yes. Yeah, uh, sorry. Okay. Was it coming from people who are actually experiencing difficulty with housing? Yeah, so a lot of the articles, there would be like a main bit and there would be a mini insert where they had some people sort of uh, discussing their own situations and I included that as well. So some of it, a lot of it was from the journalists as well and some of it was included as part of, part of the journalist story. So there, I included all of that as well. Thanks. Um, what a question, this is a comment. Sure. It's a very interesting topic that you're working on and having recently bought a house, <laughs> I'd just like to answer that comment. After I did my research, I spoke to a friend who just bought a house and I said to her, this is what I find. She goes, oh, that makes you feel better. It's not just me. It kind of like made a bit, a bit of a difference as well. So I don't really understand so the, your your terms of social content and push content. I don't I I, I don't know what they are. Okay. Okay. Yep. 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 Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, um, so I would just like to say this is my master's, not my PhD. Uh, as I said, uh, in my PhD, someone uh, suggested in the previous round that I could look at the comments, uh, for example, in the, um, in the uh, online version of the text. Um, just to answer your thing about the push content, which thank you is a new term for me. Um, I actually listened to a really interesting article on RNZ. Uh, they had a big uh, journalist conference here and they were saying that actually, despite social media being so prevalent, actually that the vast majority of us still get most of our primary news from the push content and we might respond to it in social content. I know that nowadays that, that there's a spin-off and the conversation, so there are other ways of getting our, our, our um, media, but I think within the New Zealand context, when this is our main paper still, um, I think that probably still has a lot of power. I think maybe over time it might change, and it's definitely something I could look at in the future. Thank you. Yeah.